Okay, welcome back, junkies. We are so excited to have you here today. We are talking about how much food should we really be feeding our cats and dogs? And this is such a popular question. I can't tell you how many times just in a week, I know me alone, I get this question, uh, especially on YouTube videos, but I see it on social media all the time too. It's like, how much, how much should I feed my dog? How much should I be feeding my dog? And there's like, my brain is like triggering in so many different areas when somebody asks this question. Um, of course, we know that us, us humans in the United States, especially, we just overdo it. Yep. We overdo everything. We are, we're on a trajectory where, I don't know, the whole country is, is bound to be obese and diabetic here soon. <laughs> and I say that with a lot of love and laughter because I, I honestly do think that there is a good portion of us that are waking up to how much destruction we're doing to ourselves with the overindulgences. But the truth is that we are taking our pets along with us. Yeah. And I recently read an article that Dr. Karen Becker put out that said that over 50% of dogs in the United States are overweight or obese. And holy moly, like, and, and I think the true, the same is true, if not more the people for our cats. Oh, cats. <laughs> I know, Janet, you're like, people, people. No, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure, with our people. I mean, we have gotten to the point where I read something the other day. It's normal for a 12-year-old to be 250 pounds. Well, that's not normal. You know what I mean? It, no. <laughs> so the thing, this, what we do to ourselves, inevitably, we do to our pets. Yeah. That's what's happening right now. So I, I have a few things that I will interject along the ways, but I know you two have prepped Pam and Janet so much for today. So I would, I don't, I don't want to over, overshadow anybody. I want you guys to kind of take it away. As a pet parent, you face more challenges with your dogs and cats today than ever before in history. What's the best food to feed? How do I prevent illness and help them live longer? Maybe you currently have a pet living with disease or behavioral issues and you need a different approach for success. Welcome to the Pet Health Junkies podcast. We're so happy you're here. Pam Roussel is a holistic health practitioner specializing in holistic health for animals. Janet Cesarini is a healthy pet store owner and advocate for health through nutrition. Jessica Fisher is a pet parent coach and positive reinforcement dog trainer. Join us as we share our stories, experiences, and all that we've learned to change the way we think about raising our pets. We're breaking it all down and making it simple by sharing how we help pet parents just like you every day. Because when we know better, we can do better. Is, is um, Jessica's talking, I'm thinking of the dogs that come through our shop door and how yeah. many times a day we, you know, look at the guaranteed analysis, look at the caloric intake, and we guide people. People really do not know how to calculate the um, appropriate caloric intake for their pets on a daily basis. And so... I can speak to that, but Pam, you, you go first. I always go first. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, when it comes to the cats, I learned that the cat's stomach is about the size of a ping pong ball. And that is why they do so well with smaller, more frequent meals, maybe three, maybe, you know, depending on the age, if it's a kitten, if it's a, if it's an older cat, that's just really, you know, lazy doesn't play a whole lot and that's then their caloric needs are going to be different obviously um so when when i had kittens i will feed them probably three to four small meals a day until they're about nine or ten months old yeah and then i'll transition them to more twice a day maybe depending on you know their appetites and their energy levels sometimes they they will eat a little bit more and sometimes they'll eat a little bit less 
So I kind of go with their appetite. My cats are not obese. They eat raw food. They have freeze dried sprinkles on top. And, you know, so they're, they're able to really absorb that nutrition and there's very little residue as in poop yeah. <laughs> left over, which is the best part. Mm -hmm. Um, so their, their diet's cleaned up. So they are not taking in a bunch of extra stuff that their body can't utilize, right? which is great because I really find that I don't have to feed them as much as I was when I was even feeding them canned food. Because I think the thickeners and all of that just adds more calories. Um, it adds more density to the food somehow. But my cats on raw are eating less than they were on like a typical canned food. Yeah. Not dramatically, but a little bit less. Yeah. Um, so does that make sense? I mean, it's well, just, it's interesting. It does, but like. You, you mentioned a few things. So, you know, kittens, just like with puppies, you know, you yeah. we recommend that you feed them three times a day, every, you know, during the day, every eight hours because they are growing and their metabolism is, you know, on overdrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As is energy. Yep. We want to support that, um, the body during the growth stage. So, um, we do the same thing, you know, when we talk about, um, we get the new puppies in here and, one of the um, observations that are made from pet parents is, you know, he's, he or she is always hungry and um, can't, I can't seem to feed him enough. And we often, I'm telling you, so almost every time we'll ask, are you feeding your puppy three times a day? Hmm. And inevitably they are not. And, hmm. you know, where, where they're getting their information to guide them, I don't know. Um, I can speculate, but, you know, do they hear the information and just not absorb it because you're taking in a lot of information, just like a new puppy takes in everything around them. You know, you're taking in like a baby. It's a lot going on on top of your, you know, your list of chores and responsibilities. So three times yeah. a day, definitely. And then you mentioned thickeners and when you switch from like a canned food to raw, you found that, you know, Aylin and Gunner are eating a little bit less. And mm -hmm. you, we talk about the nutrient availability and I don't, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do not know if how much cal calories are actually added from thickeners or gums, um, mm -hmm. but more so than the calories that it may add, my question is, does it, and I would think the answer would be probably so, but do those interrupt the absorption inside the gut? You know? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that maybe, you know, I, I never thought about that until you, re you brought that up. Just being mm -hmm. honest, it's something I want to go look into more, but, um, you know, when it comes to trying to determine how much to um, feed your pet, there's a formula that we follow that we got from one of the raw food pet makers. And um, it's actually you convert the pet's weight to kilograms and you do a little bit of division and a little bit of multiplication to come up with the caloric intake for mm -hmm. On a, on a daily basis. And I don't know, Jessica, if you can put that down in our notes um, or some. Yeah, is it? But it's kilogram, your, the body weight in kilograms, multiply it by 30 it, and add 70. Yeah, divided by 2.2. .2. So you take um, X, which is your pet's desired weight. Um, and so, if, you know, for example, if you have a 30 pound, and we have had this recently. In pathology, we have a family with two pugs, their litter mate. Mm -hmm. One is spot on, 13 pounds. The other one, bless his heart, is 30 pounds. Two years old. Yes, I see Jessica's eyes. We were the same way, 30 pounds. And so all of us here, when we're taking in the information mm -hmm. and trying to help the pet parents, we ask a lot of questions about you, their visits to the vet, 
you know, and what information can you share with us about um, the reports that you've gotten from your doctor, your veterinarian? And um, with this one particular case, we really re referred her back to um, an integrative vet and we told her to specifically ask about thyroid function, look to see if we've got something, you know, some underlying disease going on with the adrenal glands, because um, she says that the dog is just as active as the sibling, the, the litter mate. They eat the same, but this dog is tw more than twice its sibling's weight, which did you? Go ahead, finish. We, so th we did, going back to the formula, we took the desired weight of 15 pounds, and you're talking about 50% of that dog's weight, which is significant. You know, it's significant when you're trying to get them to lose 10% of their weight because they're so small, and, right. and our hearts go out to them. You know, I've been faced with the same situation with my Chawini that he tends to get on, you know, the, the pudgy side. He loves to supplement his diet in the backyard. <laughs> he's just, he's a great you new know, mouser and hunter. Um, but, you know, I have some experience with using weight management food and I have some experience with reducing calories. And I have finally found the sweet spot on how to control his weight and, um, and how to get the weight off of him. But, with humans, yo-yo dieting is not healthy, so it's more healthy to stay at ideal weight or under. So, you know, it, figuring that out is key for pet parents. So, with this case, um, we did the math on a 15-pound dog and came up with the um, number of calories. And again, it's really easy. You know, it's 15 um, divided by 2.2 which converts it to kilograms, then you multiply it by 30, and then you add 70, and that's the daily caloric intake. Um, and that one, I feel hopeful that we're going to be able to help her. She has been to the integrative veterinarian, and she is also starting hyperbaric therapy with the oxygen chamber, like my Hank and my Charlie are doing. And so um, it will be I think that we'll see some of his diseases dissipate, like even allergies, but that's something that we can talk about as we go in, you know, talking about best diets and, and things like that. But calorie intake is so important. So if, you know, our pet parents aren't sure, you know, that I would encourage them to grab the phone, grab the calculator, do that math and um, see where you are compare it to what you're doing. I know that, you know, when we use the eyeball method of feeding, <laughs> I, I mean, I can guarantee you that we're, unless you're a trained chef, probably are not feeding them the appropriate amount, whether that's under or over. And the mm -hmm. other thing that we see in the store, we had a cute little schnauzer. Oh my gosh, Miss Sophie. She's so cute. And she, she was looking a little um, tubular, as we call it, <laughs> where, you know, the, the front, the chest area is the same all the way back to the bum. Um, and in talking to her sweet mom, we found out, you know, well, we're asking about treats, you know, because she was feeding the right amount of calories. So, you know, you're perplexed and we're problem solving. And so she's eating the same, the right amount of calories, but we said, what about treats? You know, any, anything there? Well, no, no, no. And then we went to the treat room and she goes, well, I do have those. And she pointed to an excellent treat, freeze dried raw, um, coated in seaweed. So, I mean, excellent. And um, no preservatives, nothing that's not good for her, but we're talking a little schnauzer. One of those treats is 15 calories. Yeah. So when you have a little dog that's on 200, 250 calories a day and you're getting four of those little weenies, that's 60 calories. It's a lot. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we teach our pet parents here is um, treats should not be any more than 10% of the daily caloric intake. And that is yeah. important. You know, we have a lot of single calorie, like one and two calorie treats. 
Um, but we do have to educate and that, you know, so you're looking at how many calories in the day they need. If you're measuring it out and I always tell people, once we do this formula once, you're done. Just keep it in your drawer, in your kitchen, your catch-all drawer so that you can refresh your memory. Um, make sure you have a measuring cup. If you're not, you know, if you're doing, whether you're doing kibble or you're doing raw, you're probably going to need a measuring cup. If mm -hmm. you're using a raw patty that you can easily, you know, portion out, you know what half of a patty is, right? Or two thirds of a patty is. Um, but when it comes to frozen nuggets or um, you know, kibble, you need, you need measuring cup. And so, um, yeah, that's our, those are our stories from the trenches, but it, and it's, like I said, I've been this down this path myself with, um, Eli and, um, just finding what works. And I found that moving off of kibble into a fresh diet, what had the greatest, quickest, significant positive change processed diet i mean it's like us eating mcdonald's every day versus eating a healthy piece of chicken breast or you know a lean piece of beef with vegetables mm -hmm. it, it's a no-brainer if are we going to do mcdonald's or we're going to do a, a, a healthy you know meal and that's where that was the biggest difference um that eli we saw with him just getting him off of the kibble and um for the most part and i can speak to that as far as cats go because so many cats that are overweight or obese are eating processed pet food yeah they're eating dry food diets and pet parents don't really correlate the fact that processed pet food has so many carbohydrates and cats just their bodies are just like all right well what do i do with this yeah yeah <laughs> Well, they can't use this, fat. you know, yeah. and so they're stored as fat yeah. because they can't metabolize it. Yep. And, you know, and they're hungry. Yeah. Why are they hungry? Because they're not being nutritionally satisfied. Exactly. You know, if you were, and so clients who have switched their cats off of processed pet food onto at least canned food, if not better. Yeah. They are amazed to see their cat all of a sudden start losing the weight. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even have to put them on a diet, so to speak. They just changed the type of food they were eating. And it, it, that can be the first step yeah. that I would tell cat parents, you know, if your cat is struggling with overweight, you know, issues, obesity issues. Um, and I've seen pictures and videos online and it, it, it breaks my heart. It's not funny. No. Um, you know, and they try to, paint it in such a funny way, but it's not funny at all. Um, it's, I just tell them it, get them off the dry food and you're going to already be doing so much better for them met metabolically yeah. and they will start to lose that weight. Well, and you, you know, you bring up, um, the obesity causes disease. We know yeah. in the human world in the pet world that one, one of the major factors in prevention of disease is to control weight. Yeah, exercise is another one. Obviously, in the mm -hmm. world, you know, we need to be cognizant of things that um, over vaccination or mm -hmm. you know, flea tick and heartworm. You know, there are natural options. I'm not going to go down that path. We we have another segment on that, but you know, there are natural options. But everything um, that our pets take in. That doesn't mm -hmm. to eat, but everything that gives they absorb um, can help or hurt. You have to look at it that way. And so, when we're making decisions for our, you know, five at home or for our you know, pets here at the store, we're always coming from a place of love. I will just say that, and yeah. that we don't want to cause harm. We don't want to detract and take away. And so, if a person walks into the store and really is just open and wanting information. And they're like, I don't, you know, I don't, I need help feeding my pet. We will take them to our freezer room. That's what we would wish for them. And, um, and I have a sidebar about that because I know the statistics on, you know, feeding a 
processed kibble diet versus a fresh diet. And I know there are reasons like Dr. Becker always, you know, talks about, you know, you've got a budget, you, you know, convenience factor and we're going to throw shade on anybody for making a choice one way or the other. But when we're here in our store, we will say, ideally blue sky, we would love for you to feed from the freezer, either a raw diet or a gently cooked diet, or if that's not in your budget, if that's not in your, you know, fit your lifestyle, um, then let's talk about incorporating some minimally processed fresh food that's complete and balanced. It's all complete and balanced in the stores. What I can't just go to the grocery store and buy some meat and buy some carrots and buy some peas and boom, that's my dog or cat's diet. <laughs> right. It's got to be balanced. But, um, the the fresh food is the way to go and i think with disease prevention like i was you know talking about um just like in humans the fresher the diet the the more we can get away from processed food the better it is um today and in the long run mm -hmm. yeah and weight control so, is part of that oh yes weight control there are a couple of things that you touched on that i think are really important to talk about one is the the idea that and i know i have heard so many people say they do this i've even had veterinarians in the past recommend that i do this and i have since learned better but when you if you are feeding a kibble a dry food diet um highly processed dry food diet that's what kibble is just to, for a distinction we're not talking about a freeze-dried uh, raw because that's completely different but uh, if you are feeding a kibble diet and you do have a pet that has weight issues, which likely they do if they're on a kibble diet because of the high uh, amount of carbohydrates that turn into simple sugars in the body. And your veterinarian recommends that you decrease the amount that you're feeding. I, I've heard a couple of different things on this, but I think just the fact that there is the question that if you feed less than the recommended amount that the bag states, are we then not getting proper nutrition? Are, that, are we then not getting a balanced diet? Um, which is the whole point. Like that, that is their, you know, boot to the ground sticking point for feeding kibble at a veterinarian's office is that it's balanced. You know, your dog is getting or your cat is getting the nutrients they need. Yeah. If you then go back and say, we'll feed less than what the bag recommends, mm -hmm. are we then depriving them of nutrients that they are supposed to be getting on a daily basis, thus negating the whole argument to feed that food? Yeah. 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 And I, th I yeah. think the answer is yes. So that is an excellent observation. And you know, I was always told feed 10% less calories. Mm -hmm. I have had people, we've had people walk in the store where a veterinarian has suggested 20 to 25% less. And for me, it's alarming because not only is the pet probably going to be hungry and I don't want to cause harm. I don't want them to feel yucky. Um, I want them to be satisfied and happy and content, yeah. secure. And, um, you know, food is security. And, and so, especially when you have even rescues or even more so, but the, I have done the 10% rule. Um, and I did that early on until I started learning, you know, what I know now and had my store and, you know, there are weight management foods, which is one thing I wanted to bring up in today's talk. Um, we see weight management food, um, and when I say that, I am talking about dry kibble. I don't know of a weight management, you know, raw, gently cooked raw. Um, right. They have some trim, like canned food, but I mean, it is gross. I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> I, you know, I looked at it and I'm like, why? I mean, why would you want to do this to your pet? Who would want, I wouldn't want to eat that, but, um, there are some weight management or trim dry foods. And when you are talking about your, your point, Jessica, about, you know, what about nutrition? 
yeah. the more appropriate way to do it. But I, I also took in initially the advice of um, my veterinarian at the time, and it was cut back 10%. And I had a similar question. I'm like, well, okay, what if I take away 10%, then what does that cause? Well, weight loss. Yeah, but at what expense? You know, do I need to add anything else? And, you know, at that time in my journey, I was not asking the questions. You know, we mm-hmm. you know, fast forward 10, 10 years, you know, because that was almost 10 years ago. Um, we know a lot more. We are more empowered. The information is there. And, you know, we, I, I feel like anytime I go see any of um, our veterans that, um, I asked questions. I, I asked a question this week when we went for um, acupuncture. Um, I asked my veterinarian about listen, L Y S I N, and you know, and I, I love her because she'll say what she does and doesn't know, and she always will go research and she'll reach out to her colleagues, which I love and respect her for that so much. And she's like, I don't know what that is, and I I told her I said, you may want to look it up. Is we were talking about a dog who shops at our store that I referred to her who has some behavioral issues and I worry about vaccine toxicity. Mm-hmm. So, um, I talked to her about that, you know, product. So, um, but back to it, you know, the 10% and, um, but I found with Eli just getting him off of a processed diet works or if you can't do that 50, 50. So do the calorie intake. For the day and then if you've got to get a weight management kibble then you've got to but cut the calories in half and then let's add some gently cooked complete and balanced or raw you know it's all complete and balanced from one of your independent pet stores um and the note that i want to make because this is another mistake we see in the store is when pet parents put their pet on weight management food for life like they do not get off of it. It is, it says on the bag, to note to pet parents, read the bags. The information on the back of the bag is there for a reason. And so, mm-hmm. you know, when we get some pushback about it's, you know, how is Eli doing? We've reached our gold weight. Excellent. Let's get him back onto a maintenance diet. Um, and so weight management food is not for life, guys. Mm-mm. So once they reach their goal weight, we need to put them on a maintenance diet and preferably um, minimally processed. Mm-hmm. So, so um, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with all of that. I will say a couple of other things that I wanted to kind of interject. We did talk a little bit about puppies and kittens. I know with puppies, we want to feed the ideal weight for that age. So you might be changing how much you're feeding weekly with a puppy um, because their weight should be increasing as they are growing. So um, the ideal weight for that breed of dog, male, female, activity level, all of these things have to be taken into account um, when figuring out the number of calories that we want to feed. Ideally, we are feeding based on calories, but and I think the same is true of kittens. Is that right, Pam? When you're feeding a kitten, you're feeding them based on how much they should weigh that week. <laughs> you know what? I never weighed my cats because I got them when they were like 11 or 12 weeks old. So they weren't baby babies. And they were yeah. probably nursing a mom until at least eight, nine, ten weeks of age. Yeah. You know, yeah. Them three, so they would, you know, kittens nurse as long as their mama will let them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Won't they? <laughs> You know, they they would eat several times a day because they're growing and they have all this energy. Yeah. So when when I brought them home at three to three to, well, 11 to 12 weeks of age, that's when we just started right into three meals a day. And, you know, just giving them a little, maybe like one, one and a half ounces, depending on the size of the kitten, of course, you know, whatever they can eat. Is there a rule of thumb, like it's so many ounces per pound when you feed a cat or a kitten? That's a very good question. Not that I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. We need to look no, at that. There are some really good calculators online. Um, Pam, well, and I'll include links 
in the show notes. Um, Pam sent me one from Pet Place that is specifically for cats. And then I tend to... I tend to uh, gravitate towards Perfectly Rawsome. They have uh, four different calculators on their website. There's a, an adult maintenance for dogs and a growth and development for dogs, um, a feline prey model raw calculator, and then a raw meaty bone feeding calculator as well. Um, so I'll include links to all of those. But so when we're, I know in the raw feeding space, it's very popular for people to say for an adult dog to feed two to three percent of their body weight a day. Like that's kind of like the average that people are like, let's make it easy, two to three percent of body weight or I- ideal body weight. And I think that's a good I mean, for most people, that seems to be a good starting off point. But I also think it's really important to feed the animal in front of you. And so if you do start feeding, even if you were using the calorie, you know, figuring out how many calories they should have every day, or if you're doing a percentage, to assess after a couple of weeks, is my dog losing weight? Is my dog gaining weight? And if I don't want them to lose weight and they're losing weight, then I need to feed them more. And if they're gaining weight and I don't want them to gain weight, then we need to feed them less. And so while we can give you all of the fancy math in the world, that may not be 100% applicable to the animal that you are feeding. <laughs> that is that's a, a, even that's a hard point. Yeah, it, will, it usually will say, you know, if you read your box of frozen raw, you, you read your, your bag, it will say about, it will talk about adjusting for, like you said, I like the way you said that about feeding the pet that's in front of you. Um, and a good example in my pack is my border collie. Um, my border collie, no matter how much I feed Jack, he is on the leaner side because mm-hmm. his metabolism, his activity level is it's up there. Um, and so, you know, he, um, much like my sister growing up, <laughs> could eat a little bit more and not gain weight, unlike somebody. <laughs> yeah. So, um, But anyhow, Jack is one of those that I skew. I give him a little extra. Eli, the weenie, he gets a little less. And, you know, he is constantly appears to be hungry. And so, you know, I'm very um, particular about how I treat all of our dogs. Um, So like today they had broccoli. They love broccoli. They also had um, chicken hearts and um, not worried about you know, the calories, or I don't have to worry about preservatives. I don't have to worry about fillers and funky chemicals and, you know, just, just good, healthy food. They have strawberries. They had those the other um, day. And, and, you know, one strawberry for a dog like a Chawini, that's plenty, you know, just to satiate him. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, you were talking about the different um, calculators and that we're going to post one of the, um, other things I wanted to bring up for today's episode was when you're assessing your pet and there's, there's a chart for dogs and a chart for cats. Um, but I gave you that link to post at the pet obesity prevention.org. Um, they have the, you know, pet weight checker by it and it's visual. So, you know, you're putting your eyes on your pet and it's, you know, looking at the composition, you know, if you're, pet, what's that? Shape. The body shape. Hey there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the body shape. And so petobesityprevention.org, and it's the pet weight checker. And so that's um, the body composition is another very important factor when we're coming up with um, trying to determine, does my pet need to lose a little bit of weight? Um, my cancer dog, Hank, um, his hyperbaric oxygen uh, practitioner could tell immediately when we walked in, he was a metabolic dog and a metabolic dog is not a good thing. Um, you know, they often will end up with these serious diseases and, um, there's a lot of, you know, stagnation in the liver. And, um, he was early on, you know, I didn't know any different and he ate the big box kibble. He and all of his siblings did, 
And just like we hear from our integrative veterinarians that we, you know, all love and adore and, and learn from um, at the age of, you know, four and a half, five, five and a half, when they were reaching that senior set status, we started to see things like lipomas, um, which are indication that he's a metabolic dog. I mean, his body is not able to metabolize what is going into him. I did not know this then, but that, you know, he, when we talk about our origin story, he's the reason that I do what I do now. Um, and on a sidebar, Hank is doing wonderfully. He, yeah. and you know, he, he is a healthy 72 pounds. Um, we've, uh, just, we watch his carbohydrate intake which we, I don't think we really, we mentioned that earlier, but, um, and then in another episode, we talked about calculating, you know, looking at the guaranteed analysis, but, um, you know, your, your carbohydrates, according to, um, I think it was, was it Steve's real food? I don't know if it was Dr. Becker and Rodney Habib, or if it was Steve's real food. One of the webinars that I took once upon a time, um, we were talking about carbohydrate load in foods. And, um, oh, it was Rodney and Dr. Becker and they had mm. thin thick skin on and they were talking, mm. you know, cause she looks at when she develops her list of, you know, foods that make her annual list of good food. Um, she, one of the markers is carbohydrates. That's and right. Wants to, she, I believe it's 20% her goal and mm -hmm. a couple of them have right. around 30%. But guys in the kibble world, a kibble with like 28 to 31 percent um, carbohydrate is pretty darn good because most of them are 50 or higher. Mm -hmm. And so we that's one thing we do around here in the kibble room is we have a very carefully and thoughtfully curated kibble room and we go around and we'll calculate the carbohydrate load. So we can tell you that, you know, this one is like 29 percent if you're going to, you know, ours tend to skew lower. So um, that one thing that I really went into hyperdrive when Hank was diagnosed with cancer. So low carbs. Mm -hmm. For sure. Bring up and no processed food. Correct. Yep. Correct. I was listening to a podcast just a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Becker and Rodney and Susan Thixton and I think Steve Brown oh. and Dr. Becker made the comment because you never want to, you never, never necessarily feed the amount on the bag that says to feed your dog or cat, because it it needs to be considered for the pet that you have, yeah. not a generic animal that's on a bag. Yeah, you know. And I I say that because I have a, I have a client last this past year that said. Her cat was eating 12 ounces of food a day, and I almost fell over. I'm like, how big was her cat? Not that big. Oh my God. <laughs> not a 30-pound cat. No, we're, we're talking maybe a 12-pound cat or something like that. I'm like, no, no, no. You don't need to be feeding, like, that much food a day. Cats don't need that much food a day. Mm -hmm. You are going to have an overweight cat, mm -hmm. and you're spending way more on food than you need to. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, that was just, that was one of those, are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it goes back to the premise of us three um, women doing this. It's like, we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. We know better. Hopefully we do better. Um, and that can mean making one simple change. Mm -hmm. just start with one. Uh, yeah. So. Well, I think she had told me she was just trying to follow the recommendations on the on the product. I'm yeah. like, throw those out the door because your cat does not need 12 ounces of food per day. That is like an insane amount of food for a cat. But you know, I can mm -hmm. see though, ten twelve pound cat. I would I could see how that they would fall into that because again, when we get we learn what we learn. Mm-hmm. Whether we, if we go to a breeder to get a pet, they have their belief system and they pass that along. You go to your yeah. veterinarian, your veterinarian, you know, the veterinarian schools, they teach the same curriculum and we know who teaches the nutrition class. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, you see their names everywhere. And, you know, the ones that are advertising that are in every store, those are the ones that teach the nutrition class, y'all. And so, um, you know, there's, I'm sorry, I'm going to go there. There's more money if your pet is sick. And if your, pet, if your pet's going to be sick, I'm, I'll call it like it is. That's, well, it's true. Yeah. So, you, Jessica, when you post this, you can put a little disclaimer that says, oh, we go there. Wait till the end. I mean, it's true. It, it is. And once upon a time, when my ex-husband was in veterinary school, we got free food from that those the companies that taught him his one nutrition course. And again, it's the the healthcare system for humans and pets. If mm-hmm. you are sick, there is money to be made. And so, you know, you could say you look at it the other way too. If we want to talk about prevention, prevention isn't cheap. But I would much rather have a healthy dog um, that is a long, you know, his longevity, her longevity is um, back where it used to be. You know, mm-hmm. the lifespans of dogs that are five, six, seven, eight years, that is shocking. And that's not normal, people. No. It's not normal. And when we look back at history and we say, well, what, you know, that we didn't have commercial pet food until revolution you know not revolutionary war but the industrial revolution and Mm -hmm. was it the 40s when i think Mm -hmm. when we had our first pet food yeah is that right okay yeah Yeah. so you know they ate off the land they ate table scraps Mm -hmm. they didn't eat you know not chicken nuggets we didn't have those back then but they, you know, the farm fresh eggs, the real meat, the real vegetables, you know, um, and a little bit of grain, five <laughs> percent. But according to Doctor Best, food pyramid, five percent, um, something that would have been good of the pet. So, anyhow, I mean, there's, I love the cycle of just talking about pet food, whether it's nutrition, calories growth, prevention, I mean, whatever it is, I, I love these discussions, as you can tell. And, um, <laughs> well, and, I, and when we're talking about food, we were very, I think we were very heavily focused on, on weight today. And I think that's, that's kind of where our minds naturally go when we think of how much food it's because we're thinking of weight, but the food we feed affects everything. And I, we could have similar discussions on food for any and all ailments <laughs> that our pets uh, have today. And, you know, I think that this is really, especially when we're, I mean, well, I say especially, but really any, any illness, any disease, including obesity, is really where fresh food shines because... One, our pet is getting whole food nutrition without any of the BS, without any synthetics, without any, you know, you know, we're not creating junk in a lab to try to make our pets healthy when we could just be feeding them fresh, whole foods. And when we talked about, you know, how when we feed less than the bag says to feed, well, then are we getting all of the nutrition in our dog that or our cat that they need? Again, that's where fresh food shines because when we're feeding fresh whole foods, our pets' bodies are getting the absolute most they can nutrition out of that. Out of every bite. Meat, out of that vegetable, out of whatever it is. And so we're, of course, feeding at feeding food that isn't balanced again you know and we can have further conversations on you know does every bite need to be balanced or can we balance over time and i think there are pros and cons to both statements and in a in an industry where you are janet where you know you know somebody is just going home and grabbing a patty or grabbing a cup of food or whatever it is it's it's in your best interest to give them something complete and balanced every bite because you can't control what the end user is doing, right? Right. But then for those of us who are, 
you know, DIY or home cooking or whatever it is, rotation mm -hmm. and, and using different proteins, you know, each batch or a different vegetables each batch yeah. is going. I mean, we don't eat every bite of food we eat isn't complete and balanced. We balance right. over time. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we we really don't, but that's the only idea. We strive to, and we know we should. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think, I think to kind of sum sum it all up, we need to feed the animal in front of us. We can use fancy math and figure out how many calories a day our our animal needs, or do the you know two to three percent a day. I think for cats and kittens, uh, cats and kittens, kittens and puppies doing the calories per day makes a whole lot more sense. And then if you are doing, if you do need weight management, doing the calories per day makes a whole lot of sense. But for adult maintenance, I think the two to 3% body weight and adjusting, you know, in a couple of weeks I, can make sense for a lot of people too. So whichever you choose to do, um, mm -hmm. you know, just make sure you're adjusting for the animal in front of you. So but how would that, that work on a hundred pound dog? For two, the percentage? Two to three percent of his body weight. A hundred pound dog? Two to, two to three two pound, pounds. So two pound. I don't know. I don't know what that would do. <laughs> so that's what. Uh, let's see. So eat two to three pounds of food per day if your dog weighs a hundred pounds. Yeah. So Which, and two pounds a day. I guess it depends on the the breakdown of macros, right? So, yeah, because I know, I mean, as a, I'm more, I'm say I'm 120 pounds. I should be me personally as a human. And, and granted, we're different species. I should be eating about a pound and a half of meat a day, just wow. meat, and that to get what I need like that so it sounds like a lot of food but if you're feeding a diet based on like a barf diet like, you know, or um prey model raw or whatever you're feeding yeah. it's not well I mean it's mostly meat it's mostly you know muscle animal yeah. muscle meat so it I mean two pounds a day for a hundred pound dog is probably spot on <laughs> the math on the on our in our freezer room out there and it is it is pretty spot on. Yeah. Especially for an active yeah. dog. And if you have a hundred pound dog, I mean, granted there are some larger dogs that are more sedentary, but a lot of larger dogs are, are pretty active. Mm -hmm. um, so for active dogs, but again, that's where you have to look and see, are you feeding too much? Are you like, what is, how is their body yeah, changing? Body composition, activity level. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I think that kind of sums up. Another one. <laughs> yeah. Do y'all have anything you want to add before we end today's episode? I don't. No, I, just, I hope they get some use out of the the links that we're putting in there. Mm -hmm. and it, it's, a, it's a guideline, you know? Yeah. At the end of the day, I think for a lot of people, just like you said, having that visual, yeah. just be aware of what is yeah. your... What does their body type look like? Do they look like they're, you know, or do they look like you they're don't gone? You know? Yeah. <laughs> do you want it, you want it to look like a normal body style I'll, for I'll the pet that you it, look, it should look like the Nike swoosh. So you have the chin and then mm -hmm. it should go up into, you know, the hips. And um, you don't want, when you look at them, if, you know, you're standing over your dog and you look down, you don't want bulges on the hips, you know, and, um, and also it, before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to, you know, go online or go in your neighborhood and seek a, an animal nutritionist, or if you don't have an animal nutritionist, um, I mean, you guys, you know, Jessica, you, I think coach that, um, mm -hmm. yep. Pam, do you do that as well? Not to the degree that a nutritionist okay. would. So, um, but you know, encouraging our listeners to go online if they don't have anybody readily available in their area. And I would, you know, even reach out to 
human nutritionists and ask them if they have an expertise um, in helping you with, you know, your pet. But from our standpoint and our listeners, you know, as much fresh, minimally processed food that we can get into the diet and um, and using a, a kind of a holistic approach about, you know, read the information, but, you know, and use a measuring tool, look at the body composition, think about their age and think about their activity level. Um, and if they've got a health problem, let's say they've got, you know, a torn, you know, CCL or ACL, you, you definitely don't want to overfeed. You definitely want to keep weight off, um, so yeah. arthritis, you know, all that. So mm-hmm. good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All of that has to be taken into account. Any, any medical conditions, any physical ailments all have to be taken into account when we are deciding what and how much to feed our pets for sure. Um, and Helpful. we can, yeah, and expand into um, more of this in other episodes because we also have, you know, sensitivities. <laughs> when we have dogs that have sensitivities or, or even allergies to yeah. certain um, foods, that's that opens up a whole other <laughs> whole other issues <laughs> but um we do hope that this episode was very helpful to you especially if you are struggling with feeding your pet and how much to feed your pet weight uh, weight management for your pet um I, I think it's all w- one more thing before we end i i do think it's important uh, that we do manage weight loss to where your pet isn't losing too much weight too quickly um, that can also be be a problem. So you you know if you have a pet like Janet was talking about, it's you know they they're double their weight. Well, you know what? It might we might want to take six, eight, ten months or so to maybe even longer, depending um, you know on how the dog handles mm-hmm. uh, you know cutting back mm-hmm. and, and 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 of course getting the the thyroid checked and everything else. Um, That's very, very important. But um, weight management is something we don't want to, we can't expect, we don't, we won't lose it overnight. And we certainly don't want our our pets to lose it overnight. We need to gradually. um, Oh, and steady wins the race. Absolutely. So we'll go ahead and end today's episode. Thank you all so much for being here. Make sure to check out PetHealthJunkies.com if you haven't already done so. And if you're not already following the podcast, I don't know why not. It's absolutely free. <laughs> it's absolutely free. All you have to do is hit the follow button, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you happen to be listening. And then you will we'll be in your library and you'll get notifications. You, I think if you, if you allow notifications, you can get notifications <laughs> um, every time we post a new episode. So give your pets some extra love from all three of us today. And until next time, bye guys. Thank y'all. Bye guys.